Are you excited about being here tonight? I, I could tell. I'm pretty excited about being here tonight. Uh, man, I'm telling you, God is already doing things. He's answering prayer. He's restoring things. We're becoming the army of God. That's our vision for Habitation 2014. And I want to welcome all the people watching online. We just want to welcome you. We have people in uh, many different countries watching online. Last uh, service had over 5,000 people watching online. And so we want to welcome you to tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, I may get a little excited tonight because I'm going to share about my favorite subject tonight. I'm going to talk about God. <laughs> Is that a good subject to talk about? Hallelujah. I, uh, I remember... I was, at a, I was at a conference at another church almost 15 years ago, and the speaker was talking about how to interpret dreams and visions. And so I was listening, and he was talking about how to interpret dreams and visions and different symbols and dreams and, and different things. And, and then he said, but you have to get a revelation to be able to interpret a dream. So you just can't just figure it out. You really need a revelation from God. He said, for example... I had a dream about a year and a half ago, and in the dream, this big hand came out of heaven, and it came down out of heaven, and it pointed up, it pointed this way, and then it pointed this way, and then it went back up into heaven. And he said, that was a year and a half ago. He said, I specialize in interpreting dreams. If I told you his name, most of the people here would recognize his name. And he said, I, I don't know what it meant. He said, I've asked all my friends who interpret dreams, they don't know what it means. And uh, I'm sitting there next to Melody, and I said to her, I think I know what it means. And she said, well, what do you mean? I said, no, I really think I know what it means. And she said, well, how would you possibly know that? I said, I think I got a revelation from God, like that. So after the service, I went up to the uh, speaker, and I said, I, I think I know what your dream means. He said, really? Well, tell me. I said, the hand that came out of heaven was the hand of God. And here's what he's saying to you. He wants you to have the same relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And I said, you don't, but you're supposed to. He said, that's right. He said, that's exactly right. I don't. I, and then later as I was praying, I was thinking, well, God, why did you show me that? And I thought, it was to impress the speaker, right? <laughs> I thought, well, that's probably not it. So I started thinking about it. And I'd been a Christian for over 15 years at this point, and I realized I did not have the same, the same level of relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So I want to just take just a second. I want you to think about your level of relationship with God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And just do it real quickly, nothing scientific. You can write it down if you want, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit. But on a scale of 1 to 10, where would you rank your relationship with God, 10 being the best, then your relationship with Jesus and their relationship with the Holy Spirit. Okay, just real quickly, just take a second and just think through it just real quickly. And don't try and, you know, we don't have a lot of time, but just, you'll just kind of get it. Just you'll, you'll, you'll start ranking them almost immediately. And most of you will immediately know I have a weaker relationship with, with, with maybe it's the Holy Spirit or Jesus or God, whoever it is, and a stronger relationship, okay? So everybody kind of got their ranking now, okay? And then uh, after this happened, I, I did a survey. And we oversee uh, five or six life groups. And so I went to these life groups and I said to them, uh, I, I want to do a survey. And I asked them this question, how many of you have an equal relationship, the same level of relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? And out of 75 to 100 responses, only one person told me they had the same level of relationship. I thought that was fascinating. And, and here's what I thought as I was preparing this message tonight. Uh, here's, here's what habitation is about, okay? Because uh, I want to make this really clear. Habitation, as phenomenal as, the wor phenomenal as the worship is at habitation, habitation is not about worship. It's not about teaching. It's not about healings, though we've had hundreds of healings. It's not about miracles. We've had hundreds of miracles. It's not about testimonies. Habitation is about our relationship with God and the presence of God. I mean, that's what it's all about. It's about our relationship, growing in our relationship with God, experiencing the presence of God, and becoming a habitation of God. That's what habitation is all about. That's why we're here. 
to experience God and grow in our relationship with him. And, and here's the thing, we, we all have issues and things we're dealing with. And when we, when we come into habitations, we walk in the world today, I have, I have, I have people come up to me and say, Steve, I've got, I've got these problems with, in my marriage or problems with my health or issues with my family or work situations. And, and here's what I say, I only have one answer. The answer is God. I don't have another answer. The good news is that's the only answer we need, is God. So tonight I'm gonna talk about God. <laughs> so I'm pretty excited about talking about my favorite subject. God is one God in three persons, okay? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Theologians call this the, the persons of the Godhead or the Trinity. I mean, most people are familiar with the Trinity. God is one God in three persons of the Trinity. I'm not gonna go into the mystery of that. I think that's a mystery we'll never really understand. Our finite minds cannot understand that. But, but, but here's what I do know. God wants us to have the same level of relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Here's, here's another way of thinking about it. I have two daughters, Kristen and Cassie, and we have the same level of relationship. We don't have the same relationship in that we do different things together. Kristen likes to do this and Cassie likes to do that. They may not be the same, but we have the same level of relationship with each other. And I love them both the same, okay? And so that's the way God, I think that's the way God wants us to be with him. He wants us to have the same level of relationship and he also wants us to love the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so the, then the question becomes, well, why don't we? Why don't we have the same level of relationship? And I believe it's because we have a distorted vision or distorted view or distorted picture of God the Father or maybe God the Son or maybe God the Holy Spirit. So I'm gonna talk about that tonight. And tonight I have three points. All three points end with the same last two words. You say, well, I wonder how you did that. I'm gifted. <laughs> now they don't all start with the same letter because I'm not as gifted as Pastor Robert. Okay, I wonder what he's writing, don't you? <clears throat> okay, so, so here's this distorted view we have sometimes. So many people get their view of God the Father from their earthly father. They project their earthly father onto God. If your father was harsh, you tend to see God as harsh. If your father was angry, you tend to see him as angry. Maybe angry at you. If your father was distant, maybe you see God as distant. If your father was maybe you thought he was weak, you might see God as, as weak. Whatever it might be, we tend to project our image of our earthly father upon God. And we get the wrong picture. And, and here's kind of what it's like. We, we have some friends, uh, Jeremy Carrasco, Dr. Carrasco up here on the platform. He and his wife, Angela, they have two boys. Uh, and their oldest son is three, his name is Isaiah. But when he was about two years old, uh, they took him somewhere and he saw Santa Claus for the first time. And he got really excited. And they're thinking, why is he so excited? We've basically never even told him. We don't really talk about Santa Claus. We've never told him about Santa Claus, but he's really excited. And so he was playing with him. You could tell he kind of wanted to go over and see Santa Claus. And so he finally kind of got loose and he said, hey, look, it's Noah. I mean, he's two years old. I'm, I'm sure he's thinking like, where's the ark? Where's the animals, you know? But, but he had this picture in his mind of what Noah looked like and Santa resembled that. That's what we do. We have this picture of what God is like, but he's not really like that. And we have to understand who really God is like. You, you might hear me say tonight, uh, God's, God's the father. And here's what you may think. If he's anything like my father, I don't want to have a relationship with him. I'll have a relationship with Jesus. I'll have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, but not with, not, with, not, with, not with God. He's like my Father. And listen, here's what I want to say tonight. If you did not or do not have a good relationship with your Father, I'm, I'm sorry. I know it. I can't imagine how it hurts. I have a good relationship with my Father, but I know how much it must hurt to not have a good relationship with your Father. But here's what I want to say to you. Please listen to this. God is not like your Father. 
He is nothing like your father. God is the perfect father. God is so much higher than the greatest father that ever lived on earth. There's this immeasurable gap between God and the greatest father that lived on earth. God is a perfect father. And he, listen, he loves you perfectly. Amen. We have to understand that. We have to remove this distorted view of God as our father that we project from our earthly father. God loves us perfectly. And I think this book is about him trying to tell us how much he loves us. God is trying to convince us that he loves us. The devil, the biggest lie I think of the devil is that God doesn't love us. The devil's trying to convince us that God doesn't love us. God is trying to convince us that he does. And I think it's so interesting that the most famous verse in scripture, what does it talk about? It talks about God loving us, John 3, 16. God so loved the world. God so loved the world. He so loved you and me that he gave his only begotten son that we should not perish but have everlasting life. That's, that's how much God loves us. He's trying to convince us that he loves us. And so we say, well, why don't we believe that God loves us? Why don't we believe he's the perfect father? And it's because wrong things happen in our lives. Things go wrong in our lives. Sometimes it's our bad decision. Sometimes it's our wrong thinking. Sometimes it's, you know, just things just happen in life because there's evil in the world, there's sin in the world. I mean, just, things just go wrong. But another reason that things go wrong is other people, right? Other people. Now, I'm not talking about y'all, okay? I'm talking about other people, okay? I want you to understand that. But think about this. Things were going pretty well when there was just one person. I mean, things were going well. Well, here's Adam getting to hang out with God. Lots of time, lots of free food. Lots of pets. <laughs> Got to leave the toilet seat up whenever he wanted to. I mean, it was, it was, things were going pretty well, except for the whole day about the alone part, right? I mean, things were going pretty well. Add one person, just one person, and look what happens, All right? One person. And I'm not talking about because she was a woman, that is not what I'm talking about. But just add one person, now we got sin in the world. And then what happens? They have two sons. I mean, now you've got, only got four people, and, and Cain goes and kills Abel. I mean, think about this. Just, just other people. Now, this is happening with just four people. Now add, now add a thousand. Add a million. Add six or seven billion people. We've got problems, right? We've got issues. I mean, six or seven billion people, all with free will and all with a sin nature. I mean, we got problems, right? We got some real issues here. And listen, I know terrible things happen to people. Listen, that is not God. That is not his plan. That was never his plan. That's the devil's plan. That's the devil doing that. So think about this, six or seven people, all with a free will, all with a sin nature, and then you add the devil to it. Listen, we got problems. We got issues. And then here's God who says in Romans 8, 28, he works all things together for good. For those who love God and are called according to his purpose, he's trying to work it all to good. Can you imagine? He's up there with six or seven billion people doing all these things, trying to make it work together for good. I mean, that's, and he's keeping track of us. I mean, think of God as this worldwide GPS system, right? He, he's keeping track of six or seven billion people. And then here we go. He's keeping track of us. And so we, we're going along, and we take a, 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 a right turn. He wants us to take a left turn. No, 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 don't do that. I mean, he's given us instructions. He's told us how to get to where he wants us to go, right? He tells us how to get there. He's the world's best map quest. Amen. Okay, uh, Google Maps. <laughs> Google Maps. And he, he tells us how to get, he gives us instructions, but we, we keep going the wrong way. And so finally, he, he gives us a voice. In 300 yards, make a left turn, right? Anybody recognize this? Right? I mean, that's, that's what he does. There's this voice that guides us. And, and sometimes we don't want to listen to the voice. And so what happens? We, 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 it says take a left turn, and we're just not thinking. We take a right turn. Maybe we're not trying to do anything wrong. We just take a right turn. And what happens? You made a wrong turn. Make a U-turn, right? Make a legal U-turn. Here's his voice, you know. And then what happens? Recalculating. Right, recalculating. 
But here's God with six or seven billion people going, recalculating, 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 recalculating. I mean, isn't that the way it works? Can you imagine God trying to do this? Listen, the answer is not to turn off the voice. I have a friend that was driving along, and his other friend was with him, and he said, you know, you can, this, the GPS has a voice. You don't just have to watch it. It has a voice. He said, I turned it off. So why would you turn it off? I think she's mad at me. <laughs> Listen, God is not mad at you. God is not mad at me. He is the perfect father. He is not like our earthly father in almost any way whatsoever. He's so much higher. Here's what John 3, 17 says. The next verse says this. John did not, I mean, excuse, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, to condemn you or me, but that the world through him might be saved. Listen, let me, let me, let me give you the truth. Here's what Moses when he was on the Mount of Sinai, this is what God said to Moses in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. He said, and the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God is merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. God is not who we say he is. God is who he says he is. He is the perfect Father. He is God. Amen? Okay, so I got this revelation, and I didn't really have a whole lot of really problem with God. I just, I always just thought, read the Bible, believe the Bible, believe God. Never had a real problem with my relationship with Him. But I just kind of, I got, started getting interested, and so, so then I, I did another survey. And here was, here was what I said. I said to about 75 people again, maybe 100, describe Jesus in one word. Describe Jesus in one word. And so I got a lot of words. I got the word love, compassion, peace, joy, savior, healer. But I wasn't getting the one word that I was looking for. And finally, one person out of 75 or 100 people said, hmm, describe Jesus in one word, uh, God. I said, that's it. <laughs> that's it. That's my point number two. Jesus Christ is God. He is not a man. He is God. See, we have this image of Jesus as a man. But as we read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and it describes him as a man. It talks about him as a man. So we get this view of him as a man. Or maybe we see a movie and we think of Jesus as a man, but just, a, you know, a better man, right? Kind of a godlike man, a very perfect man. We, we, we read a children's book or, or a children's Bible and we see Jesus as a man. But let me tell you something, Jesus is not a man. We tend to relate to him as a man. He is not a man. He became a man. He was a man for 33 years. He is no longer a man. He is God. We have to think of him as God. I understand he was our example. I understand that sometimes it's easier to relate to him as a man, but he is God. When, with the rest of the, of the New Testament, after the Gospels, they only describe him as, as God. They talk about him as God. They use the words like God, son of, son of God, Lord. Those are the words used to describe Jesus. And Paul even says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16, he says, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh as a man, yet now we know him thus no longer because he's God. He was a man. He's no longer a man. He's God. Jesus as a man is a very, very small part of Jesus as God. The Bible, when it talks about Jesus, it's a very tiny part of who Jesus really is. Listen, this is why it says in John chapter 21, John chapter 21, verse 25, it says, and there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that were written. I remember I listened to a guy, we talked about this verse, he said, well, I mean, how many books can you read about what Jesus did? He was thinking of him as a man, but Jesus is God. Think about what Jesus did eternity past. Think how many billions and billions and billions of people Jesus Christ has affected. If you started writing out all the things that Jesus has done, it would fill enough books to cover the earth because it's innumerable what Jesus Christ has done. 
and all the things he'll do in the future. Jesus is no longer a man. He's God. We have to get a revelation that he's God. I remember a, a pastor friend, I shared this with him. He got really excited about Jesus as God. And he just got this revelation. He starts sharing it with people. And this guy was listening to him. He said, I want to invite you to come speak at our conference and just share about this revelation that Jesus really is God. He's not a man. And so this pastor, he got really excited. And, and he goes to this big conference. And they, they gave him like 10 minutes to speak. And he's going to share this revelation. And he's just all pumped up about it. This is his big opportunity. And he said, I just love Jesus. I've got this revelation that Jesus is God, and, and I just want to do a Jesus yell. So would you all join me? Do you love Jesus? And he said, yes, we love Jesus. Let's do this Jesus yell. Let's spell out Jesus. So are you ready? Yes. He said, give me a G. <laughs> Some of you will get that in just a second here. <clears throat> See, this, was, this may surprise you because most people's greatest relationship, the strongest relationship with Jesus. But it was the weakest for me. It was just the weakest for me. And here's why. This, is, this sounds terrible now that I understand but a little bit more than I did, but, but here's what I thought. Um, I understand Jesus Christ died for my sins on the cross, okay? And I'm grateful. I mean, I made Jesus Christ Savior. I made him Lord. I'm so grateful he washed away my sins. But that he died on the cross, I was like, well, he knew he was going to he knew he was going to be alive in three days. He knew he's only going to be dead for three days. I mean, he knew that, right? And then I think, you know, there are soldiers in war who, who die for other people. They throw themselves on a hand grenade, right, and die for other people. So I just, I just, I don't know. I just didn't think it was that big a deal. Can anybody relate to me? Anybody here know what I'm talking about? You, you, what's, what's the big deal? I promise you, it's a big deal. So, so. So, so one day I go on a sabbatical, I'm bothered by this, because I know I, I need to have this equal relationship, and I need to keep growing in my relationship with God and the Trinity. And so I'm praying about it, and God gives me this revelation of Jesus. And it's like, Stevie, he didn't go to the cross just as a man. He went to the cross as God. He could only take our sins because he was God, because as a man he never could have, even though he had to do it as a man. Think about this. He took all the sins of the world, past and future, on himself on the cross. And so here's what we think. Well, my sins aren't that bad. He took my sins on the cross. Mine aren't that bad. I mean, I've done a lot of bad things, but, but I mean, he's Jesus. He's God. He can handle that. Listen, think about the worst atrocity you can think of. He took that on himself. He took murder on himself. He took rape. Every horrible thing that's ever been done, he took on himself. The perfect God, the perfect man. Can you imagine? And not only did that, he was separated from the Father. He'd never been separated from the Father. Can you imagine what being separated from the Father is like? He'd been waiting for eternity, living in light and joy and love and peace. And then he said, no, I'll go do it, God. And he was separated from the Father. That's what hell's going to be like. I mean, separation from the Father. Can you imagine? And he did this for you, and he did it for me. He was separated from God, the Father, so that we would never have to be separated from God, the Father. That's what he did for us. Listen, if you feel separated from God, the Father, if you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, he is the answer. He's the answer to get to God. It's the only way we can get to God is through Jesus. He's the answer. It's like the little four-year-old Sunday school class. The teacher one day said to the kids, hey, what's, uh, what's small and brown and has a bushy tail and likes to eat nuts? And none of the kids said anything. They just sat there. The Sunday school teacher thought, well, this isn't that difficult, so said again, what's small and brown, furry, has a bushy tail, and likes to eat nuts? And finally, little Billy raised his hand. He said, um, I know the answer is Jesus, but it sounds like a squirrel to me. <laughs> Jesus is the answer. Here's what he says in John 14, 6. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, except through Jesus. That's what he did for us. Jesus loves us. He intercedes for us. 
He commands the angels for us. And then he lives in us and through us. We just don't grasp the enormity of God living in us. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus died so he could live in us, so that we could have the life that God wants us to have. We cannot grasp the enormity of what Jesus Christ did. He is not a man. He is God. Amen? Amen. 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 Okay, the Holy Spirit is God. Point number three, the Holy Spirit is God. I never had a problem with the Holy Spirit being God. Uh, Jack and Sharon Giggle, my, my, my mother and father-in-law, uh, and Melody, I dated Melody in college. When I met Melody, started dating her, they were all spirit-filled. And so I was like, yeah, okay, it makes sense to me. They explained the Holy Spirit, and, and so I, I got it. And so I never had a problem really questioning the Holy Spirit as God, but, but, but many people do. Uh, or they think, uh, he's just some distant figure. Listen, he's not some distant figure. He's not an it. He's not an influence. He's not a power. Listen, he's not weird, right? I mean, Pastor Robert says, he's not weird. People can be weird, right? Uh, most of you in here are probably maybe a little too young or maybe not charismatic enough to, to remember Flag Lady. Some of y'all remember Flag Lady, right? <laughs> Flag Lady. Okay, there was this lady back in the day, right? Back in the late 80s, early 90s, there were a lot of conferences. And uh, you go to these conferences, it seemed like every conference we went to, Flag Lady would show up. <laughs> and uh, sometimes there were several Flag Ladies, but there was one in particular that was just a little, I mean, she was just a little weird. And uh, she wore this, uh, this white skirt that came up to about right here, you know, all full length. And then she had this blouse that tucks in. And then she has these long flowing sleeves on her blouse. And then she wore this little hoop in her head. I never could figure out what that deal was. You know what I'm saying? It was, just, it was a little weird. And then she had this, uh, this purple sash. And uh, this is a little weird, isn't it? Okay, purple sash. She had these golden slippers. And the gold meant something. The purple meant something. The, the hoop meant something. I, I don't know. Okay? But I just, I mean, listen, I love dance and, and the arts and all the things that we do in the spirit of the Lord, but some people are, are a little weird, right? <laughs> so, uh, so Flag Lady, um, she was multi-talented. She could do the glory hoops. <laughs> she could do the tambourine, which, you know, nothing's more irritating than tambourine that's just slightly off the beat. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> She'd do the interpreted dance. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I could raise money with that, Pastor Robert. Okay. It's like, uh, and then the little streamer things, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and they're kind of, you know, coming past your face. Yes, yeah, so sit up at the front, you know. But what she specialized in was a flag, you know, or a banner. But it was mainly a flag. That's why we called her Flag Lady, you know. She, and she was doing the, you know, oh. and then she kind of start twirling it, you know, and doing this. Some of y'all have, like, have no idea what I'm talking about. And so we called her Flag Lady. I don't know how, how good she was, but she, was, uh, she made up for it with enthusiasm. Um, she was high energy, okay? And she just kind of showed up. And she had this flair for these dramatic entrances, you know what I'm saying? And uh, uh, you know, we, we, we're not supposed to draw attention to ourselves, but she seemed to like that. And uh, so anyway, so one day at this church was having this conference, and uh, the church had decided that they didn't want Flag Lady uh, at their church anymore. And so uh, they're right in the middle of the worship, and, uh, you know, this song's going on, this high-energy song, and here comes Flag Lady in the back door, coming right down the aisle. Well, the ushers don't know what to do, because they know the Flag Lady's not supposed to perform at the service today. So they start chasing her down the aisle. And so Flag Lady, you know, I mean, she starts off like this, and then it's like... <laughs> and she, she comes down the aisle, and she comes across the front of the stage, and she keeps going faster and faster. <laughs> You know, still keeping beat. It was pretty amazing, okay? And I don't know if she tripped over her uh, skirt, but it ended up on the floor. And so Flag Lady kind of stops, and she grabs her skirt, and I, I give her credit. She never missed a beat. I mean, just like this. Just, and, then, 
there's this exit over here above the, off the stage, and she just goes right out the exit. <laughs> Never saw Flag Lady again. <laughs> Y'all are wondering, what in the world is he talking about? So anyway, people can be weird. That's all, that's the whole point. I don't know why I told that story. It's just... What was my point here? Was there a point at all? The Holy Spirit's not weird. That's what I was trying to say. The Holy Spirit is not weird. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I sure hope Flag Lady's not here. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is not weird. He's God. Listen. He guides us into all truth. That's what the Word says. He empowers us to do His will. He teaches us all things. He gives us power. He gives us power. It's what the Bible says. He gives us power. He is the power of God. He's the dynamite of God. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it says, you shall, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be witnesses to, to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the outermost parts of the earth. He gives us power over sin, power over problems, power over impossibilities, because He's God. The Holy Spirit is God. He's the same God. He's the same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. He's the same Spirit, the same God who heals us. He's the same God who delivers us. He's the same God who speaks to us. He's the same God that gives us prophetic words and healings and miracles and gifts of faith and all the gifts of the power of the Holy Spirit who is God. That's who the Holy Spirit is. He's God. And here's the good news. God, God is here to help us. Amen. And that is good news. He's here to help us lead the Christian life. Listen to what John chapter 14, verse 16 and 17 says. This is Jesus talking, and he says, and I will pray, this is before he goes up to heaven and, and sends down the Holy Spirit, the Father sends the Holy Spirit, he said, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, the Spirit of God, God the Holy Spirit, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with and will be in you. He lives in us and he helps us. The Holy Spirit is God. So picture yourself in this situation. Okay? Just picture yourself in this situation. You find yourself in a hostile, foreign environment. Listen, we're at war. Does everybody know we're at war? There's a very real war going on right now. A very real war that affects the physical world, a spiritual war that affects the physical world. We're, we're in a war. So you find yourself in a hostile foreign environment. You are clueless about what to do next. The enemy is closing in, and as far as you know, you have no allies. You feel your assignment is way beyond your capability. Suddenly, a coded message comes in through your cell phone giving you the name and number of an undercover agent who is internationally known for his incredible strength, wisdom, and warfare strategy. When allowed to help, he has never lost a single battle. He has advanced knowledge of all the enemy's plans. He has a team of fearless commandos who work with him that just seem to appear on a as-needed basis. One of these commandos is reported to have single-handedly destroyed 185,000 enemy troops. Most important, he has indicated that he and his friends are just itching for a fight and would love to come and help. So here's my question. Would you call him? And here's my second question. Considering his track record, would you allow him to lead or would you insist on being in charge? <laughs> we have the cell phone of the Holy Spirit. We can call him anytime we need, and he's here 
to help us. Why? Because he is God. He's not just here to help us. He can help us because he's God. That's the Holy Spirit. Amen? Let me finish up with this. <clears throat> yeah, let's give the Holy Spirit a hand. He's God. He's God. You know, many times the world doesn't honor the Holy Spirit. Many times there are portions of the church that don't honor the Holy Spirit. Listen to how honored the Holy Spirit is in the Godhead. Okay, this is Jesus talking in Matthew chapter 12, verse 32. This is how honored the Holy Spirit is. Here's what Jesus said. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him either in this age or in the age to come. I don't know about you, but I don't think I want to speak against the Holy Spirit. Here's what he says in Luke 12, chapter 10. To him who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. Those are strong words. This is Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit. If we reject the Holy Spirit, We've rejected God. How are we going to live the successful Christian life without being led by the Spirit of God who is God? How are we possibly going to do it? And so obviously for 15, 16 years of my Christian life, I, I wasn't aware that, that really God wanted us to have this same level of relationship because they're all God. And then I started asking, well, why don't I? Why don't I have the same level of relationship with God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. I started asking questions. And it wasn't I just wanted to bring Jesus up to a new level. It started making me think, why aren't they all at higher levels? And so I'd, I'd get a greater understanding, a greater revelation of God the Father. I think, well, I need to understand that about Jesus and I need to understand that about the Holy Spirit. It just moves you up. It changes your life. I'll never forget when I got that revelation about Jesus on that sabbatical. I cried for several hours thinking how wrong I have been. I've slighted not a man. I've slighted God. I'm, I'm telling you, it changed my life. It changed my life. I think it's going to change your life. So let me just recap. <clears throat> God the Father is not like our earthly father. He's God. Jesus Christ is not a man. He's God. The Holy Spirit is not an it. It's not an influence. He's not a, some distant force. He's God. God's greatest desire is that we have a relationship with him in the Trinity. God the Father. God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Would you bow your heads? I just remember when I started getting these revelations about God, it gave me just this greater intimacy with God, this greater openness to God, this greater ability to connect with God because I didn't have these walls, I didn't have these false images, these wrong pictures of, of the Trinity or the different members of the Trinity, greater peace, greater security, greater love, greater power. I felt like I could have a, a real relationship with the creator of the universe. I wasn't hiding something over here that this unbelief or this wrong thinking. Now, we all have to keep increasing. We'll be increasing our knowledge of God for eternity, literally eternity. I understand that. But I just felt like I took this quantum leap in my relationship with God. And I, and I, I knew Him more. I wanted to live for Him more. I wanted to obey Him more. I wanted to love Him more. It, it just changed my life. So I just want to take a, a few minutes here and just, just say, what is God saying to you tonight? What's he saying about your relationship with him? What's he saying about your relationship with God the Father? God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Is there something that, 
that you just had the wrong view of God, the wrong thoughts, the wrong beliefs, the wrong picture. And God just wants to tear that picture down. Maybe he wants to give you a revelation of why something happened in your life, that he was there. And he allowed it for your good. So many times we let a situation just turn us from God. Maybe, maybe it was other Christians, other people, other Christians that you said, if that's the way Christians act, I don't want to know their God. Listen, that wasn't God. You know, some Christians operate under the influence. And I'm not talking about the influence of the Holy Spirit. I mean, we can, we can be affected, we can be influenced by the devil and his demons. Maybe there were Christians that said the wrong things or did the wrong things and you said, I, I, I don't want to be a part of that. Listen, God doesn't want you to be a part of that either. He does want you to be a part of Him. He does want you to be in relationship with Him. He does want you to be in love with Him. Here's God's desire that you have a relationship with him, that you draw closer to him. In whatever area that it is, maybe say I have a great relationship with God the Father and God the Son, but I just never understood the Holy Spirit. Does it, I hope it so helps you. Listen, I hope this so helps you, that he's God. Please don't blame some of the things that people do and they, and they attribute to the Holy Spirit. Please don't blame it on the Holy Spirit. Listen, we can, listen, people did strange things in the Bible. I understand that. But under the, because of the Holy Spirit told them to do it. I understand that. And just because somebody does something weird doesn't mean it's, or seems weird, doesn't mean it's not God. But we have to, the Bible tells us to examine the spirits, test the spirits. So would you give God an opportunity right now just to speak to you, to tell you how much he loves you, to tell you how much he desires you, to tell you how much he wants to be in a relationship with you. Let me speak to you about lies maybe that you've believed. Maybe decisions that you need to make. So I'm not, I'm not gonna believe that anymore. I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna let that stop my walk with God, my relationship with God. I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk with God. I'm gonna build a stronger relationship with him. I'm, I'm not gonna believe the lies anymore. I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna lay down the hurts that I got at this church or that church or this group of people or that group of people. Well, just let God minister to you right now.